So today we are going to talk about characterizing phase boundaries or phase transitions, right? A phase boundary represents when you change from one phase to another phase in the phase diagram. And we have seen some phase diagrams now. For example, we, have, we haven't really talked about why the lines are the way they are. So for example, if, if you look at a pressure temperature phase diagram, we know there will be some line that looks, I have drawn lines like this for you, where I said, okay, this is phase alpha, this is phase beta, this is phase gamma. And this over here is where the phases alpha plus beta coexist. So at this particular point, at this particular pressure and temperature, alpha and beta like to coexist. They are in equilibrium with each other. In the next few classes, we are going to talk about how much alpha and how much beta like to coexist. We will go to multi-component multi systems and talk about how does the component partition between different phases and things like that. But today, the question we are going to ask is, what decides how this curve looks like? Why is it sloping upwards? Why is it sloping downwards? Should it slope upwards with a small slope or with a very high slope, things like this, okay? So in order to do this, let's think about, and, and this will lead us to something called Clapeyron equation. And a simplification of the Clapeyron equation is known as Clausius Clapeyron equation. Even though the name is bigger, it's a simpler equation. And we'll see what all these are, they're quite simple. So let's talk about a simple, a very simple picture where we have pressure and temperature, and we have a phase boundary between two phases, okay? So we have this phase boundary, and this is phase alpha, and this is phase beta. So along this boundary, alpha plus beta coexist. So my question is, if at a point A, we have certain pressure and temperature, pressure PA and temperature TA, and if there is some other point where I have temperature TB and pressure PB, what can we say about delta P and delta T? Do they depend on each other in a certain way? And specifically when you're thinking about points A and points B being close to each other, then you can talk about dP by dt, right? So we are trying to figure out what can we say about dP by dt for this curve, which is, what is dP by dt? dP by dt is nothing but the slope of this curve, right? So we are trying to figure out how does this slope of this curve depend on other things that can be measured, okay? So in order to do this, notice that at point A, alpha and beta are in equilibrium. And this is a constant pressure temperature phase. Diagram. This is a pressure temperature phase diagram, right? So at a given pressure and temperature, alpha and beta are in equilibrium. What can we say about alpha and beta mathematically? What must they have equal? Your hint is this is pressure temperature. Which state function? Go ahead. Gibbs free energy. Mu is just per mole. So Gibbs, Gibbs free energy should be equal, right? So at point A, G alpha should be equal to, uh, let me uh, write it using subscript for no special reason. G alpha is equal to G beta. And I'm saying that at point B also, they are the same. At point B also, G alpha must be equal to G beta. G alpha and G beta have changed as you go from point A to point B, but they are the same for both phases. So what does this tell me about the DG? How much did the free energy for alpha change? This means that the free energy change for alpha must be equal to the free energy change for beta as you go from as you go from A to B, right? They had the same free energy at point A. They had the same free energy at point B. It means that during this process, they must have changed by the same amount, right? Otherwise it's not possible. So <clears throat> DG alpha is equal to DG beta. But what do we know about DG? And this is in a one component system. That's quite important that all of what I am doing, these equations, all of today is for one component system. 
deriving these equations for multi-component system, I will show you how to do it. I will just give you, tell you how it's done, but we are not gonna go into it. It involves partial pressures and gets messy. But this is just for one component system. For one component system, we know dg is equal to vdp minus sdt, right? Because there is no mu dn term. So if you look at equation one and look at equation two, let's write them down on the next page as we work through it. So I'll draw the picture once again, just for your reference. We have a point A and we have a point B and we have some delta P and we have some delta T. This is temperature, this is pressure. And I just said, and this is phase alpha, this is phase beta. I said dG alpha is equal to dG beta. And I said, this was equation one. And I said dG is equal to VDP minus SDT, that is equation two. So if you mix equation one and equation two, that tells us that the volume of phase alpha, and we are talking about such small changes that we don't expect the volume itself to change hugely. We expect the volume is roughly kind of same. Okay, so volume alpha multiplied by dp minus s alpha multiplied by dt must be equal to volume beta multiplied by dp minus s beta multiplied by dt, right? So here we have assumed that assuming v alpha, v beta, s alpha, s beta are unchanged which it's not that they don't have to change. Basically we are saying that delta P, delta T are very small. We are talking about very small changes in pressure. If you change something very, very tiny amount of pressure, the volume is not going to change hugely. Volume of alpha is different from volume of beta, but together they are approximately the same value. Maybe you have parts 10 to the power minus 6% change, but something very small. So that's the key idea are approximately unchanged. So this is equation three. Equation three comes from equation one plus equation two, right? So let's rearrange equation three. Let's bring this dp dp term one side. So what will that give us? That will give us v beta minus v alpha multiplied by dp is equal to s beta minus s alpha multiplied by dt or dp by dt is equal to s beta minus s alpha by v beta minus v alpha is equal to the change in entropy during the transition divided by the change in volume during the transition. And this equation is our, is known as the Clapeyron equation. This is really, really general. We did not assume ideal gas we did not assume anything. We are just talking about the slope at a particular point. How much did the pressure change with respect to small changes in temperature? So this equation is known as Clapeyron equation. Any questions about this? It's, it's a very simple derivation. In order to do this, we said, well, at point A, the free energies must be equal since they are in equilibrium. At point B, the free energies must be equal. They are in equilibrium. So they must have changed by the same amount. So dG alpha is equal to dG beta. We are talking only about one component system. So there is no mu dn term. Therefore, dG is equal to Vdp minus SDT. And when you equate it, you get dP by dt is equal to delta S by delta V transition. Okay. Any questions? No? No questions? I think we're just running I stop. Go ahead. Transition. So at this point, when you change from alpha to beta, you, you would have a change in the entropy, right? That difference in entropy is delta S. You have a change in volume. That difference, like let's imagine ice changing to liquid water. Right? So that's the change. So this, this is the general framework. This is called Clapeyron equation. What we are going to do now is to look at this equation for solid to liquid change, liquid to gas change, and solid to gas change individually, one by one. Solid to liquid change will help us show that ice skating does not work with localized melting. That's something we'll prove today, that it's not the reason. Okay. <clears throat> Everyone, huh? Is there a science for those? I noticed that you can, well, they 
either way at the alpha minus b radar? Or it depends on, you just have to define the numerator and denominator the same way. Okay. That's the thing, right? So it doesn't matter. You can't do it delta s for alpha minus beta and delta v for beta minus alpha. That's what works. So just stay consistent. The only sign convention in thermo that you have to be very careful about is du is equal to dq plus dw. There, if you mess up, you will get in trouble. Everything else kind of magically works out. So, okay. So for the remaining part of this class, we are going to be using dp by dt is equal to delta s by delta v. Both of these are measured during the transition, during the phase transition. So let's use this to study solid liquid transition. Okay. So for solid liquid transition, dp by dt, solid liquid transition is normally known as fusion. You can think of liquid solid transition as the same, it doesn't matter. It's the process for fusion, right? As liquid gas is known as vaporization. This is known as fusion. Anyone remembers what is solid gas known as? Sublimation, Sublimation right? So these are the three names, sublimation, vaporization, and uh, fusion. So this is fusion. So in this one, it will be delta S fusion by delta V fusion. And uh, delta S fusion can be written as we are talking about change at a given temperature, right? And a given pressure, pressure. So it can be directly written as delta H fusion divided by temperature divided by delta V fusion. So if this, if this is not clear, how did I do this? The idea here is that delta S is equal to delta Q reversible by T at constant pressure, that is delta H by T, okay? That's how I got this. So dp by dt is equal to delta H fusion divided by temperature divided by the change in volume during fusion. So I'll just write it down once again, dp by dt is equal to delta H fusion by temperature divided by delta V volume during fusion. So let's try to see the signs. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, at constant pressure too. We are talking about change at a given pressure and temperature. Okay. Sorry, yeah, so well, in this case we have both. So pressure is kind of subset of that, you're right, you're right. So let's think about delta H fusion and let's try to think when something changes from solid to liquid, do you have to give heat to it or do you have to cool it? What do you think, Marco? It's not a very profound question. You have to give heat to it. So what does it say about delta H fusion, the heat given, taken by the system? It's gonna be positive, right? Is this always true? Does anyone know of an exception? There is kind of like only one or two exceptions to this on all of the universe. The only exception to this is something called helium-3, which is super cooled helium. That's when it becomes a superconductor and things like that and all sorts of funky things happen. In helium, in order to go from solid to liquid, you have to actually cool it, which is super bizarre. So you can go and see, there have been Nobel Prizes. Feynman actually used to work on it for many, many years. Go ahead. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It is very strange. It's liquid helium is the strangest thing you can think of. Well, we, we, we might use liquid helium for cooling, right, in the lab, maybe liquid nitrogen or things like that. But when you go to two or three Kelvin degree Celsius, helium becomes very strange. So except liquid helium, which we know is very peculiar, almost everything, you have to give heat in order to melt it, right? In order to go from solid to liquid. How about, so this is true almost always, except helium three, and we are not going to worry about that. How about delta V fusion? When you heat something, does when you heat something to when you when something changes from solid to liquid, does it expand or contract? Except water. except water. So delta V fusion is more than zero. Again, almost everything. But if you ride your bike like me in during winter months, then you probably must have memories of your butt getting really sore by falling on the road, right? Every once in a while. And you can blame this for that because ice expands. It comes and floats on top of water. 
if I didn't do that, it would be so nice. You know, we could be we could be just jet skiing or something. You know, that won't work. So this is true for water. Water has this peculiar property where, and why does this happen for water? That I cannot answer you in this class. You should ask your 482 professor. That's basically quantum mechanical. The hydrogen bonds in water are very peculiar, which tend to do something very strange that when you melt it, uh, uh, it, it behaves very different from everything else. As we know, this is, this is critical to life, right? In lakes, this is important because if you go and look at frozen lakes, right? Life exists under the ice only due to this reason. But if you look at this, this tells us something very interesting now. So what can we say about dp by dt? dp by dt will be positive for almost everything. And dp by dt will be negative for water. And this is not always, this we are talking about only solid liquid transition, okay? We are not talking about solid gas yet. This is the solid liquid transition. On top of that, let's think about the magnitude of delta V fusion. So what is delta V fusion? Delta V fusion is V solid minus V liquid. So even though for water it is negative and for everything else it is positive, it is not a very large difference, right? When you have something, I forgot my coffee today, when you have some, or my uh, cup of water today, when you have something solid and it melts, the volume does not go up by like 500 times, right? Have you ever seen that happen? It happens when something goes from solid to gas or liquid to gas, right? Gas can have tremendous amounts of volume. Solid to liquid volume change is kind of small. It's not a very large number. It is there, it will happen, but it's not, it is not a huge number. This is not a very large number. So what does it tell us about sign of dp by dt? It can be positive, it can be negative. For water, it will be negative. For something else, it will be positive. But will it be a very small number or a very large number? Huh? Who said very large? Why, Stella? It's very, very small, right? Exactly, Stella got it right. So this will be very, very large. So now we can think about the phase boundary in the phase diagram for water and for everything else, the solid liquid phase boundary, okay? And see how it will look like. I'll wait for a moment. Is anyone here friends with Erina? Erina Lee? Is she okay, do you know? She got into a scooter accident yesterday and she's in the hospital. So be careful when riding your scooter. I know I sound like a grandpa. Scooters are dangerous. On my bike, sometimes I see people just have with music, no helmet, and going on scooter. It's be careful on scooters. I hope, please, if, are you going to meet her? Okay, well, I hope she gets better. <laughs> you had a question? Yeah, I was just going to ask why Delta V is uh, wrong. Is there like a reason why it's always true? Yeah, think about the, potential energy, curve. Yeah, think about the potential energy curve. You know, you don't move that far. That's the point. Solid liquid, is, is, that's, that's how the nature of interaction. Liquids still have some crystal structure preserved, right? So why it really happens is because liquid still, the, the, the correlation function between atoms does not die off quickly. Things still try to stay together. Okay. That's, that's, that's the nutshell answer. So now let's look at the phase boundary. Given this piece of information, we are talking about pressure temperature and we are talking about solid liquid phase boundary. So should this line be like this or should this line be like this? Go ahead. Very steep, right? Because the slope is very large. So the solid liquid phase boundary will look for, for everything almost on this planet, it will look like this. For water, it will look like this but either way it will be very steep, okay? So this is for water and this is for everything else. And we are talking about solid liquid phase boundary. Okay, so it's very, very steep. In fact, if you look at an actual phase diagram, it's almost vertical because the change in volume is so small. Okay. So let's try to calculate the slope of this. 
And let's try to see what it actually is for the case of water, okay? So for water, <clears throat> I will draw one more copy of this and then we'll work with this. So water, and I will draw the full phase diagram for water. So for water, we know it's going to have a slope that is negative. The other parts of water look something like this, and we haven't yet talked about why they look like that, but we will get to that in a moment, okay? But I wanna first do the full thing. So we know this is liquid, this is solid, and this is gas, this is temperature, this is pressure. So let's zoom in on this. So the way ice skating works is, let's say you have something at zero degrees Celsius, okay? The typical ice skating rink is not at zero degrees Celsius. It's a bit colder, right? It's, it's kept around minus seven degrees Celsius. That's a typical temperature. So once you go to minus seven degrees Celsius, at normal pressure, at minus seven degrees Celsius, you expect solid ice, right? If that didn't happen, then life is very strange, right? So at normal temperature, you expect to have normal, at minus seven degrees Celsius and one atmosphere pressure, you expect to have, expect to be deep in this solid part of the phase diagram, right? You expect solid ice. So the whole idea here is that we want to apply so much pressure if, ice skating indeed worked by you applying a lot of pressure on the ice so that it melts and then you can skate through it. That would mean you have to apply this much delta P pressure. And actually let me do one thing so it looks a bit cleaner. I don't want it to coincide with the triple point because that would be problematic, okay? So I want this to be lower. So I want to apply a bunch of pressure so that we move from this part of the phase diagram on red to this part of the phase diagram where solid becomes liquid, right? And then we have localized melting. We have melting of ice and we can skate on it. So we have our delta T over here. How much is delta T? Seven, right? So my, my, since I moved that thing, I have to be a bit careful. So we have this, it's, we have delta T is equal to seven degrees Celsius and we need to calculate delta P, okay? So let's do that. So we have delta T is equal to seven degrees Celsius or seven Kelvin, you know, the difference is the same and we have to calculate delta P. So delta P by delta T, we just derived the equation that will be given by the latent heat of fusion. Remember it was, Delta H divided by T divided by change in volume, right? So it will be latent heat of fusion, which is Delta H divided by the change, divided by the temperature at which this is happening, divided by Delta V. So here we showed, and let me use Kelvin now. We showed Delta T is equal to seven Kelvin. What is the temperature? The temperature can be, if you're talking about zero degree Celsius, the temperature is going to be 293 Kelvin. If you're talking about minus seven degree Celsius, temperature is going to be 286 Kelvin. You can use either of those values. You will find this calculation does not depend on it, okay? We are just going to use 293 Kelvin here. Again, you can use 286 for it. It won't change the numbers that we are going to get here. It will change it by maybe 2%. The change is quite small. So that we got Delta T, we got T, L and Delta V, you can't remember, right? You know it's some number, but I looked it up on the internet and L, the latent heat of fusion for ice is 3.34 into 10 to the power five joule per kg. This is the amount of heat you need to give to ice, this many joules in order to melt one kilogram of ice. And the change in volume, is negative, but we are going to use this. Uh, uh, yeah, so we will keep this as negative. So delta V for ice is minus 9.05, 10 to the power minus five meter cube per kg. Okay. So we have, we have all the numbers now. We can go and plug in and calculate delta P. Delta P that we need will be delta T divided by T multiplied by L multiplied divided by delta V. If you do the math, this comes out to be around 100 megapascal. 
Does anyone know the atmospheric pressure in pascals? Huh? 100 kilopascals. So this is 1,000 atmospheric pressure. That's a lot. None of us can apply that much pressure. If you had really, really skinny feet, like a guitar pick, and you weighed a thousand times more, even then you won't be able to apply that much pressure. And guitar and, and ice skates are tight, right? They, they are narrow. But this is pressure you cannot generate. You can go and do the math and try to see. I mean, <laughs> one strategy might be to eat a lot of food, you know, before going ice skating. So you get heavy and have really tiny skates, but even then it won't work. It's a very large pressure that you need to know. So we have just shown that ice skating does not work through melting of the ice. It's not that you melt the ice and then you form lots of liquid and you skate on it. So how does it work? Well, I don't really know. And it turns out it's still argued upon as to how does it really work. The best, con and I posted an article on Slack on, on how it works from Vox. There is also an article on New York Times. You can read it. The Vox article cites my friend from uh, UC Berkeley and UC Davis, David Limmer and uh, David Donadio. And uh, the best bet is you do have some sort of melting, but it is not melting in this term. What you actually do is to form, and why does ice skating work is not in 481 syllabus, okay? I'm just, this part is in the syllabus. Why does it work? It's just purely for entertainment. So the way it works is you have solid ice, which is some sort of, uh, let me actually draw, a, uh, hexagonal crystal structure, that's better. So you have uh, you have some sort of crystal structure for ice, and on and this this is ice, you know, it's it's very crystalline, it exists. And what people think happens is you form some water on top of it. So there is some melting, but this layer of water that you form is around two to 50 nanometer for ice skating to work. It's barely any water. It's, it's a nanometer thin water layer that you form. And the reason why this is so hard to find or measure or prove is because it doesn't form during a lab, right? You have to be applying a lot of pressure. You have to be moving, that's when it forms. To study it, you cannot just take it and do it. People have been able to do some electron microscopy to see this, this is what happens, but some people still argue over it. So, but this is why this equation is. So we just use Clepron equation to show that in the water phase diagram. So first of all, if water did not have this negative sloping thing, then this would simply not happen, right? The more pressure, if water was not like this, the more pressure you applied, you will just stay in the solid phase. You will never reach this liquid part. So in order to reach this liquid part, you needed to have a negative sloping curve. Is, any questions about this? Go ahead. Is it what? Yeah, it's for fusion. So, yeah. Um, did you also just say that like your internal water is the condensation of the water? Well, you should read those articles and then people still fight over it, you know, what you're saying. So you, you, you seem like you're ready for a career in science. There's still people fighting. So I, I don't know. I really don't know. I do know that it is not thermodynamic melting the way we think, because that would require this much pressure. So you might think, well, if a nanofilm is formed, why isn't that melting? But that's not equilibrium, right? It's why only nano? Why isn't it becoming micro? What's stopping it from doing that, right? So some people also think it's maybe friction and you're generating a lot of friction. You can disprove even that one. So there are various ways to debunk it. And that's why New York Times is still carrying an article on it in 2015 as to why does ice skating work. Okay, so I wanna finish, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a bit, I, I love when you guys ask me, uh, guys and ladies and everyone else ask me questions, but today I want a bit less questions because I want to finish this and go give my colloquium. We don't have a lot left, it's just a little bit. So we talked about solid liquid, now let's talk about liquid vapor boundary, okay? So I want to basically finish today, how does the water, phase diagram look like. I showed you the pressure temperature thing slopes negative. Now let's talk about liquid vapor. So same idea here, we will talk about dP by dt is equal to delta H vaporization divided by temperature divided by delta volume vaporization. Once again, delta H vaporization tends to be positive. You have to give heat to something in order to vaporize it. You can't cool it and then it becomes vapor. 
that's typically true. But what about delta V vaporization? Is this going to be a small number or a large number? It should be a huge number, right? You're going from liquid to vapor. So this will be something much more than zero. Therefore, dP by dt is going to be quite close to zero, right? Now the denominator is a very large number. <clears throat> so, and, and with this, let's just finish our, uh, which one remained? We did solid to liquid, we did liquid to vapor. So what remains? Solid to vapor. We can do solid to vapor boundary. Same idea will apply here. DP by DT is equal to delta H. In uh, this case, it's sublimation divided by temperature, delta V sublimation. Once again, sublimation enthalpy tends to be positive. You have to heat something in order for it to become vapor. And delta V sublimation is also a very large number, right? perhaps even larger than delta V vaporization instead of going from, so this is a very large number because V gas is much more than V liquid. And this is a very large number because V gas is much more than V solid. And V gas just dominates both of them. It's way more than V solid or V liquid. So once again, so this was dP by dT vaporization is close to zero, dP by dT, sublimation is close to zero. However, we can we know that it is going to be positive. Both of these are going to be positive, right? None of the numbers in the numerator and the denominator are negative. Everything is positive. So with this information, now we can actually complete our phase diagram in the pressure temperature part. Let's start with the solid, let's start with the liquid vapor part. So liquid vapor is going to be a line with a very small slope, which looks something like this, okay? So this over here is liquid. This over here is vapor. Let's talk about solid and vapor. That's also going to be a line with a very small slope, which will come and, I'll use different color, which will come and meet it over here. Similar slope. I'm not going to worry too much about whether their slopes are, which one is more, which one is smaller, which one is larger, that will also depend on the enthalpy change. So let's just say they are small slopes. They are kind of close to the x-axis. So now we are talking about solid over here, and this is still vapor. And the third one, which is the solid liquid one, we just saw that for almost every, almost everything, it will look like this, but for water, it will look like this. So this is for water and this is for everything else. So you have just, hopefully now you understand why the water phase diagram looks like that. This point over here is called the triple point at which all three phases of water exist. Next week, we will be talking about this very peculiar point which is called the critical point of water. And we will use the Van der Waals gas to understand why, what happens over there. So, and can we have a quadruple point in water phase diagram? No, because Gibbs phase rule showed us you can't do that. But if we had water mixed with salt, then we could have quadruple point, right? Because now it's a two component system. If you have water mixed with two kinds of salt, you could even have pentuple, I don't know, what do you call after quadruple? Huh? Quintuple, see, he's, 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 he's a scholar and a gentleman. I didn't know quintuple. I don't know what the gentleman part is, a scholar though. Okay, so we got our phase diagram and we the equation that allowed us to do that was this Clapeyron equation, which is dP by dt is equal to delta S by delta V. It was quite easy to derive. I also told you, I will tell you about Clausius Clapeyron equation, which is a simplified form of Clapeyron equation. So let's do that one and then we are done. Clausius Clapeyron equation is simplification of Clapeyron. It makes a couple of assumptions. Clapeyron equation did not make any assumptions. Clausius Clapeyron makes two assumptions and it applies only to liquid 
vapor, okay? So we are talking about a very specific case of the Clapeyron equation, which applies only to liquid vapor. <clears throat> so the first assumption that we make here is vapor is perfect gas, okay? It's an ideal gas. So that means the volume of that gas can be written as RT divided by P. And a second assumption that we make here is that the change in volume during vaporization, which is vapor gas minus vapor liquid is exactly vapor gas. We completely ignore the vapor liquid part, okay? We just talk about vapor gas. So using both of these, we can say that therefore delta V vaporization, we are assuming as RT by P. So let's go to our Clapeyron equation. Clapeyron equation says that dP by dt is equal to delta H vaporization. In the next homework, you will have problems working through this. So you will have lots of time to become familiar with all of these equations. The next homework will be out on um, Monday or Wednesday, something like that. So delta H vaporization, what, what's our equation? Divided by T divided by delta V vaporization. And I know it's almost 9.40, so I'll finish soon. Uh, so this is going to be delta H vaporization by T divided by delta V vaporization. But we just said delta V vaporization is RT by P, right? So we can bring this value over here and this will become P divided by RT. Therefore, dP by dT is, uh, and this is approximate because we have made this assumption. So dP by dt is pressure multiplied by delta H vaporization divided by RT square or dP by P is equal to delta H vaporization by R which is the gas constant multiplied by dt by t square, where we have made yet another third assumption that delta H vaporization is independent of temperature, okay? And this looks like t multiplied by two, but it's not t multiplied by two, it's t square. So now we can integrate this. We go from some pressure P1 to P2, and we go from some temperature T1 to T2, and once we integrate it, should I integrate it? No, let's not integrate it. Let's forget about the integration, sorry. Let's just leave it at this form. You can integrate it if you want, if, if you need to calculate things, but we will write this as, therefore, D ln P, right? DP by DP is D log of P divided by DT, is equal to delta H vaporization by RT square. And this is the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. So Clausius-Clapeyron equation applies only for liquid vapor transition. It assumes that vapor is a perfect gas and it totally ignores the volume of the liquid. That's how we get the clausius clapeyron equation. It's useful sometimes, you will see. Yeah, it's, it's a quick way to do things. And uh, any questions about this? Okay, so as, uh, I will leave this on for a moment as I pack up. So a <clears throat> couple of things. Mid uh, so the midterm will be announced sometime next week, which is, so before 12th, around 10th or so, you will have three weeks do the, now pay, pay attention before you pack up entirely. This is how it's gonna work. You will be split in teams of around five people each. You will have choices of five papers as a team you will, and you won't get who is on your team. I will be deciding that. So you guys who sit in the same corner will not be on the same team, that's for sure. I know who sits where, okay? So you're gonna mix. You're gonna get mixed up. And then you will decide who works on which paper. Then every team, and you will have three weeks to do all of this after this. Every team member will submit an individual report on the paper, just a two page report. I will tell you how the report should be. I will tell you what I expect in the report. Then after that, you will prepare one presentation as a team. And in the first week of December or something around that, you will be making the presentations over here. So every team member will uh, allocate one person to make the presentation. 
it will be a three minute long presentation. The presentation will be on my computer and I will be sitting here with a big stick. As soon as you go after three minutes, you know, I will come and poke you off. So you have to get off. You have to do three minutes. Everyone will make presentation. You will be graded on two bases. Your report, I will be seeing how you are graded and your team making a presentation and your team certifying that everyone contributed to the presentation. It's like an honor code thing. If your team says like so-and-so did not participate in the presentation, then you will get points deducted. So make sure you act as a team. And uh, final thing here is you will all vote on which presentation was the funniest presentation. And the team which has the funniest presentation, I will take you out for ice cream at Maryland Dairy. Okay, so see you on Monday. Uh -huh.